Hi. Um, today, I want to talk to you about another writer that I know and some of her work that she put out into the world in this really cool little zine. And I hope that... I hope that a lot of you will do things like this. I always encourage um, writers and poets and anyone I know to put their work together into something that you can hold in your hand. I really think that um, as writers and artists, finishing something, however small it may be, helps us, um, or large that it may be, it really doesn't matter, but it helps us to finish other things, to have a sense of accomplishment and gives us a way to share it with other people. Um, sometimes I think that we get too wound up in is, am I gonna make this thing that um, that I can make into this product? How am I gonna afford to make this product? Is anybody gonna want to produce my product? On and on like that. And meanwhile, while we're kind of having all of these thoughts about um, production and what, is meaningful or what has value of all these kind of these ways that we've been gaslit um, by our culture away from being our own uh, to being our own artists to being this to being people who communicate with each other through creative works while we're busy devaluing our uh, ourselves in that way on all these different levels what winds up happening is the poem never gets to a point that 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 it feels finished for you. The story never gets to a point that feels finished for you. And, and that I think is the worst thing that we can do to ourselves, not only as artists, but just kind of as people in general. So I think putting something together and saying, well, that's, that's going to be my, that's going to be my completion. That's going to be the way I get closure on this or however you want to put it is a really, is really, really important. Um, I also want to say this, that nothing ever really feels finished. There's this old story that Gore Vidal used to tell about Tennessee Williams. And I forget which play it was that it had opened, but um, Gore Vidal and Tennessee Williams were very good friends, apparently. And uh, Tennessee Williams had one of his plays had just had opening night. You know, he was a very successful artist in his own lifetime. And so it's just been opening night and... Or Vidal walks in the place that they shared together, or were staying at in together, whatever it was. He looks over and he sees um, he sees Tennessee Williams working, and it's right after the opening night of his of some famous play of his. And Gore Vidal says, "What in the world are you doing?" And uh, Tennessee Williams says, "Well, I'm working on." And he names the title of the play that had just opened, and Gore Vidal says that just opened. And Tennessee Williams says, "That doesn't mean it's finished." OK, so I think while I think that's particularly true with playwriting, I don't you can't really finish a play until you see it um, on the stage with actors doing it. Uh, while I think it's particularly true of playwriting, that playwriting's really, truly never finished. Um, I do also think that any form of, of writing or even any um, maybe other forms of art also the artist maybe never really feels um finished and so to just put something together and say um that's that's going to be my finished piece this is i'm going to call it i'm going to call it you know now i'm going to call it this is finished is a really really important thing to do psychologically it's just it's kind of like uh it's picking up the pieces of yourself and putting them into some kind of order because they never you never get there like life is not this um it's not this thing that comes to some kind of uh some kind of um, conclusionary statement. I mean, really, honestly, until you take your last breath, you are you are thinking it through and you're changing and you're healing and you're saying, oh my goodness, I was so wrong about that. So many things that are going on. And, and I mean that when I say that, that's if you're lucky because I'm sure every single one of you watching this knows somebody in your life who has become so set in their ways and in their mindset that all you can see on them is just this fear of finding out that that's not how it works. That's not how it goes. Right. And, but they're probably some very difficult people. They're probably very hard people to know. And I'm sure all of you know them, but for others of us that are a little bit more pliable and who are on this plane of existence, uh, trying to, um, we're not trying to just living. Maybe we maybe we try too much. Maybe that's really true. Maybe we try too much. But for those of us doing this examined life business and so on and so forth, I really think that the one of the primary ways that we're going to do a good job at that is to 
always be in process until the very last moment when our time is up here. Okay, so <laughs> all of that having been said, what I really want to talk to you about is this zine by Dix Marie. It's called uh, My Deep Fried Heart on a Stick. And I want to show you how it's done. Look, any of you can do this at home and you should. Look, see its pages? And like, you know, these don't even have staples in them. You could staple it, but you don't need to. You can put it together. You can fold your work together like this. And you can have something to give to other people, something to put on your shelf, to put on your coffee table, to put in your bathroom, whatever you, whatever it is, so that, that you say, this is my thing that I made. And instead of it just being a lot of random um, things in your computers and your notebooks and things, you don't ever feel like have a completion point. Because I know Dix is still working with uh, a lot of what she started in here, if not actually the words that she started in here. But this is not stone. It's paper. Okay, folks? Like, so you can make, you can make things and you can change them later. Isn't that cool? Um, but you can still have that sense of having accomplished something. This is an accomplishment. So, I want to talk about Dix Marie a little bit because she is my friend and I've now been really had the pleasure, really a pleasure of knowing her. I'm sorry, this little piece of hair is just kind of killing me back here. Um, I can see it in the camera. Um, so she's my, okay, Dix Marie is my friend and I've known her for very many years. Um, um, at this point in time, I've known her for, um, gosh, 20 years, I think I've known Dix. And so I've had the pleasure of doing performance with her. She and I used to do drag shows together back in, um, drag king shows back, to, back together, back in, um, back in New Orleans together in the early aughts. Um, she did fire chains. I can remember making fire chains with her on my porch porch in new orleans like we have if you don't know what fire chains are you make these chains and you like you soak them in gas oil whatever and you you dance with them and so we may <laughs> a lot of you are going to know that some of you aren't so um but I, I have all these memories with um with Dix, and i've known her for a long time and um she's just really one of my favorite people in the world i just really can't speak highly enough of her and a couple of years ago i felt really fortunate when she signed up to come up be one of my long six week writing workshops. And that really was such a pleasure because I got to hear a lot of her poetry during that time. And I got to share a lot of space with her just lovely self. A really great talent is her variance in not only and not only her style, like whether or not it's it's going in it's it's a longer piece of prose or it's smaller bits and pieces. I think that's a really cool thing about her writing. But I also think it really indicates something about psychology that I think Dix gets to that I think is that she shows not only in the words that she writes, but on the page itself and the way things look on the page. I'm gonna show you inside of this a little bit also. Um, but our ability to any memory that really has a point a to point b is something that someone is telling you or telling themselves in order to help our narrative sensibilities like we up here this part of our i always have two parts of the brain there's the front stage you know and back here right and so this part of our brain it really likes a narrative. It likes us for, to go from point A to point B. But in reality, like, we don't live like that. And our thoughts from moment to moment aren't like that. We can all think of ourselves and other people where there's this stone cold inconsistency where it's just someone will tell you, well, you know me, I'm like this. And you think, gosh, are you? You know, but you do the same thing. We all do it. We're all we're all incredibly inconsistent. And our memories have gaps for various reasons because of time, because of because moments were extraordinarily painful or they were extraordinarily elated. Um, perhaps they were. um what do you call it, crossed with um, various kinds of substances or very exciting activities, you know? Um, so anytime we go to tell a story and, and, you know, like sometimes, you know, people just kind of, you're like, wow, the whole story was true, but then part of it that wasn't true. And so I kind of, what I feel like Dix is able to do here is when she has a fragment, she's like, it's a fragment. It's a fragment. It's okay. I'm not going to fill in the blanks for you with something that isn't true.
true or isn't real or isn't or doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is there are these there are these fragments and they're 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 important because we're made of fragments. At least that's the way I take it. So let me show you. You can see that she's got some pictures on the front because it certainly is memoir work that she's doing here. So those are pictures of her and her family. As you look inside of here, she has these she has pictures and photocopies like these are these are things, like this is stuff can you see my finger this is stuff these are poems that she wrote on paper when she was a kid and pictures of her family and her um when she's using um these quote bubbles in some places which i think is really great especially that's a picture of her and has a quote bubble um that kind of tells you what her mind was thinking at the time which i think is really cute this is a letter from her this is a letter um everything goes backwards on this screen by the way i mean for me it goes the, as you can probably tell um this is a letter her best friend wrote to her when they were kids so i love how this is put together and i feel like um there's several there's several poets and artists who have made some really great books like this the one that really comes to mind for me is claudia rankin um who does uh her book uh don't let me be lonely is really good though oh, that's one of my favorite books of poetry don't let me be lonely by claudia rankin and she has these she has these pictures in it i know uh daphne gottlieb is working on some things um that have that format anyway i think it's a wonderful format especially in these days where i think it could be a i think it's a great format i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some other things later this week uh that have uh, text exchanges and uh, Twitter feeds and so on and so forth that are being put into the text. These are the people that we are now. So I think really being hanging on to some kind of antiquated past, I don't think makes our art better. I don't think it makes us better. I think us moving along with where we are and who we are in those environments is deeply, deeply important. Every single person listening to this knows how powerful a text exchange can be. Every single person listening to this knows how powerful it can be when somebody feels like they can unload on you on your social media, right? Like every single person here knows how powerful those formats are. You know how important those things are to our lives. So I think we can include them in text. But I digress. So um, anyway, she has, she's just marked, she's gotten, she's done things in this, in these pages that I think are really cool. And I think really make this fun to look at. And I think it tells me a lot about her in a lot, in a few brief pages. So I'm going to put all of her information down below because you can definitely get a copy of this and other things that I'm sure are forthcoming and other work that she's been doing. I know she just got a new job and we're all on quarantine and all these things are going on. But I also know that she's been writing for a very long time. I've had the pleasure. I mean, like I used to listen to her poetry 15, you know, 16 years ago. And I can remember her reading um, at Flora's in, in New Orleans back when there were poetry readings there pretty often. Maybe there still are. I don't think there are though, but um, I can remember. I remember, I remember poems she wrote 15, 16 years ago. I can think of them in my mind. And uh, that's powerful. Okay. So for anyone that's out there and you're thinking like, oh, well, what really matters is, is doing this work that millions of people are going to want to um, listen to. Well, you know what? There's millions of people who can't remember most of what they read. But here I am, and I can still think back to pieces of poetry um, that Dix wrote 15 or 16 years ago. So you tell me what matters, okay? So um, what I want to do is read you a section from this book um, from her scene. So I'm going to read you this section. This is really, I got to get a little drink here. Hang on. I'm starting, I'm coming in on this uh, a little bit about three fourths of the way through on it. So she's already really talking about, this is a period in her life a long time ago. And she's really talking about a period of time that, where she became unraveled and was unraveling. And so I'm going to read this to you. And I think it's, um, I think it's really beautiful. I think it's really scary. I think, um, whew, I'm already emotional. I haven't started I think a lot of you'll be able to relate to this and I hope that you understand why the fragments are so important. And I think you will when you, when you put your own emotions into what we're listening to. Okay. So like I said, this is dropping in about three fourths of the way through. I drank, I cooked, 
I went mad in the home I made for us. I disappeared into bad lesbian fiction and books about mass murderers. I wrote about my father's mistresses and mine. I wrote through medication and roulette diagnostics. I feared my mail. I tried weekly to die. The doctor in the ER treated me like a sick joke. And I was. She stayed. She worried that I was writing for public consumption made her look bad. It does. It will. It did. But worse than me, unlikely. This is not payback. It's bravery. Hers, mine, and ours. I swallowed harder, wrote less, read more. I became nocturnal and unhinged. Once, I threw a pair of kids' shoes over her head while she was kneeling down. They landed on the wall and dropped with a soft anger at her feet. Once she wrestled me to the ground for the exacto I wanted to decorate myself with. I was strong and sick and determined. She was bold and victorious and unharmed. She might write a different truth, flatter herself as the true target. Bullshit. I grew tired of licking my wounds and hers. I just wanted some goddamn peace and quiet, not a chorus of pain. Not her gorgeous brown eyes narrowed on me, her lips disappearing into middle-class disapproval. She became both of her parents. I became the absence of mine. I wanted a way out. There was nothing left to stuff into those pockets. The seams were breaking against the weight of my words. I stopped performing my feelings and I learned the mimicry of early abandonment. I burned like a tired, dirty candle, hollow and barely lit. Oh, she of questionable provenance and even more questionable sanity. I started sleeping on the sofa, on the bathroom floor, on the other side of the bed in a different zip code. I stopped trying to rise up and bring her with me. I stopped trying. I stopped. She fell in love with someone else. She lied carefully. She said, I brought it on myself. I said, she helped. Eight years of swallowing my words and her fears of resisting being rewritten in her image. Eight years of swimming passion, of fierce love deep into the night, the private exchange of vows, of unimaginable laughter and knowing. It was never just one thing between us or against us or within us. I could not handle her mortal dread and she could not handle my complications. There was no credit for holding on until I could no longer bear the weight of anxious assimilation. No credit for fixing a thousand uninspired dinners, making a beautiful home, or carrying her mother's contempt. All currency and heroics were hers. I was merely the freeloading, shabby, chic fishwife who couldn't get out of bed. We made love to say goodbye, barely breathing through the taste of each other's tears. The second greatest gift of her love was the day she left me to only my own demons. I couldn't imagine loving anyone that way again. We found, find each other in dreams. I never asked her to go. We were, are both beautiful and whole and free. That is what I tell myself, asleep or awake. She still texts me when she feels lonely or sorry or both. Once from a Sade concert with her wife. As you can see, that makes me really emotional. <laughs> As well it should. It's really beautiful and it's really honest and I think it's really healing. And um, I think all of you can do stuff that makes people feel and that's important. And I think you can put it in a zine. <laughs> and I think that you can give it to people who are going to care. And I think you should do that. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess before I just full on cry right here on camera, I'm going to say goodbye. And I'm going to let you know that um, all the links are down below. Okay. Thanks. There's more to come.